At this time, it's my honor to introduce the uh, participants in the keynote conversation this afternoon. In interest of time, I'll keep their introductions brief. Lorelei will be moderating the panel. Lorelei Oviat is the Director of Kern County Planning and Natural Resources Department. Uh, I don't think she needs a, a extensive introduction in this crowd, but in uh, rereading her bio, a couple things popped out that really caught my attention. Again, 20,000 megawatts of renewable energy being permitted by Lorelei and her department. That is absolutely a astronomical number. That's larger, that's more renewable capacity than most European nations. Uh, it, it is really a uh, remarkable accomplishment by Lorelei and her staff. And what I really enjoy coming to these events for mostly, and I think most of us here would agree, that our opportunity to listen to Lorelei in her experience, we all get a little bit smarter on how to get things done in California. So Lorelei will be leading up that conversation. Joining her will be Francisco Leon. He's president and chief executive officer, California Resources Corporation. He joined CRC in 2014. Uh, Mr. Leon holds his MBA from University of Texas, Hook'em Horns, and uh, has his BA in international business from San Diego State University, a little closer to home. And uh, also on the panel will be Alan Pitts, Vice President of uh, Chevron San Joaquin Valley Business Unit. Based in Bakersfield, Alan oversees Chevron's oil and gas production business throughout California with operations in Kern County, Fresno, and Monterey counties. Uh, in his 35 years at Chevron, Alan has held a variety of assignments, including positions in the UK, Indonesia, Denmark, Australia, Thailand, and the United States. So we're fortunate to have him on his tour here in Bakersfield. With no further ado, please join me in welcoming Lorelei and our keynote panel. So thank you so much. We're going to have a conversation. We're actually going to take questions. So, you know, start thinking about those. And I cannot say how honored I am to have these two gentlemen who represent the future of Kern County. You know, I think every day, I hope they're getting rest. I hope they get a nice vacation because what they do in their organizations are gonna shape the future of where we all go with this. So my first question for you gentlemen is, what are your companies doing for low emission oil, and how do you see that playing out in Kern County? Good question to start with. Uh, thank you so much for having us uh, here, Lorelai. It's, uh, it's so good to be, to be in front of uh, everybody today. Um, so um, at California Resources, we've, we made the decision to embrace change and to build a company that's solutions-oriented to a better future. So when you say we're the future, we really wear that and feel we, we are the future of energy. Uh, we're also the present, and present is matters to all of us as well. And I think as we look for an evolution to the what's next, uh, the, the big opportunity is to improve what we do. And so kind of in all the noise that you hear about energy and oil and gas, What's getting missed is the transformation that we've already taken as companies here locally that are better, the best in the nation in terms of practices. So we're already doing that. And we, we don't brag about it. We were already talking about, okay, the what's next, but the present is important. We have really, truly national leading practices uh, on environmentalism in terms of safety, uh, in terms of performance. Um, so it's with that compromise of doing what we're what we have today, extremely well, better than most, is how we take the, think about the future. Um, so what we see is a, a future that has lower emissions uh, as a critical purpose of the state, but also more affordable energy. And it's a combination, it's, it's a dual challenge. We a lot of times forget and think it's one or the other, or transition from one to the other, it's both. 
both need to work. We need to deliver cleaner air, but we also need to make energy more affordable. And we think in our platform, what that means is through carbon capture and sequestration as the key anchor of our strategy to use a lot of infrastructure that we already have in the state and make it better. Make it better by reducing the emission footprint, but also using facilities and infrastructure that I already have. Again, you don't want a lot of pass-throughs to consumers. Um, so carbon capture and sequestration that then allows us to bring projects like direct dark capture, uh, which is direct carbon removal. Uh, we're also looking at what's called BEX or bioenergy with CCS, uh, which is a fantastic solution for all the forest fires that we have. A lot of it is the accumulation of dead wood that we have no place to put it. Well, we can burn that uh, or companies that, we, that we're going to bring to the state. And if you have CCS, right, so the ability to capture those emissions before they hit the atmosphere, then you can store those emissions, and it's a great solution that solves multiple problems, right? So, so we're committed to this. We're making big investments, bringing some of the world's biggest investors, and we're starting here. It's Kern County that gets this going. It's always the innovative hub, the energy capital of California, and this is where we're going to begin, and this is how we're getting started for the future. Thank you, Laurel. I, I, again, <clears throat> thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation. I, and just building up from Francisco says, I'm just going to take us up a level and maybe look at what we're doing from a company perspective. And that's really based on two beliefs. One of them is energy needs to get cleaner over time, and we, believe, we all believe that. But two, oil and gas is going to play a key part in the energy system for decades to come. So if you look at this from a global perspective, energy use is going to increase by about 20% by 2040. So it's a huge energy system we have. And it's predominantly still going to be oil and gas. So if you look at those two beliefs, cleaner oil and gas is going to be predominant. We are investing $10 billion as a company between 2021 and 2028, looking at those two things. One, how do we make the product we produce day in, day out, cleaner in our production, reduce our carbon intensity. But two, how do we continue to work with our customers so they can reach their green goals? <clears throat> and we're doing that through a variety of means, whether it's geothermal, whether it's CCUS, which is important, hydrogen, renewable fuel. So we're, we're taking a broad spectrum. Because we talk about evolution, we talk about transition, and there's still a huge amount of uncertainty out there. And when you've got uncertainty, what you need is diversity. And we need to have a diversity of solutions to manage through this transition and not vilify one over the other. And oil and gas is going to play a part in that. So if we look a bit closer to home, what we're doing is, is like Francisco says, we're not just talking about this, we're, we're taking action. And it is action that's important so we can deliver reliable, affordable, and ever cleaner energy to continue home and human progress. And energy has delivered human progress for centuries. So we have great assets here. We've got fantastic people. And we've got a county that supports business. We've got a su county supports innovation. And Lorelei, thank you for your pragmatic view for permitting. So we've been trialing capturing technology, We've been using hydrogen as a fuel source, as a substitute for natural gas. We're looking at using our solar energy, our produced water, and producing hydrogen. And, and like CRC, we're looking at DAC. We recently entered into a partnership with the Department of Energy, where we're looking at feasibility studies for DAC. And the focus is on Cairn County, because Cairn County has some great pore space to store and, and uh, sequester uh, CO2. So that is so inspiring. So now what I'm going to ask you is we have this massive gap between the things your company are doing, the investor confidence that people have in these companies. Wall Street wants to put money here. And we have this gap with the state policies. We have a gap. What, what are your thoughts or what are your companies doing inside that conversation of how do we, how do we navigate all of that with the state of California? 
It's a tremendous challenge in, in the, the it's, it's about connecting the dots for people. I mean, energy can be com com complex in terms of where things come from, how things are made of. I don't think we take a lot of things for granted. And in that, what you lose is the ability to, to drive through complex systems and get to an answer that, that makes sense for a lot, uh, for a big stakeholder group. Um, we're, we're very, um, we put a lot of time and effort, you have a lot of CRC folks that do this every day, that are uh, going to Sacramento and, and uh, governor, governor's office, legislators, and trying to showcase um, something that's really important, which is, you know, the, the point of, uh, the, the premise that comes from, from, from the state is, uh, we're doing something bad and we're gonna go to something better and we need to, we need to put a timeline. Um, but that's not the way we should be working. As Alan's saying, oil and gas will continue to be a big part of this. It, and it's the point that we don't need to make things mutually exclusive. You can do two things at once. You can make better quality air, better environment, very better for the environment, but it needs to be also a, a, a decisions that are rooted on good economic principles. And, and it's bringing, uh, bringing things to the table that, that connect and, and have that dialogue in a straight way, uh, in a straightforward way, that, that ultimately gets people to, to start asking themselves kind of the right questions. I mean, if, if you don't mind, Laura, let me, let me make this a little more interactive to kind of prove the point, right? So um, when we talk about oil and gas, the, it's a, it, it seems to always be around gasoline, fuel, electric vehicles. So we have a solution, and the reason we don't move to electric vehicles is because companies like us are resisting the change. And that's not it. The reality is the electric vehicle has its own challenges. Uh, the market should decide, and if that's where we want to go, we go. But the complexity around what we're trying to solve through in a transition is much greater than that. It's somehow things get forgotten. So, you know, just a show of hands, real quick. Do we have any, like, power chat GPT users on the crowd, right? Anyone using chat GPT? Okay, so right now, they're like, it's what, is, is, is what these guys saying, Right or not, okay. Um, so chat GPT, prompt and say, you just put a couple sentences. What retail brands would not exist if oil disappeared today, right? So it's basically asking chat GPT, you're not asking me, you're not asking Alan, ask chat GPT, the all powerful chat GPT. That's right. <laughs> give me a list of 100 brands that we use every day that would not exist without oil. You're gonna be, I mean, it's gonna be shock. Mm -hmm. The answer is gonna be shocking, right? It's gonna be all the brands that we use, that we wear, that make our lives better, that rely on all the things that come from oil. So it's either rubber, or nylon, or polyester, or some type of uh, synthetic fiber, right? So we as humans take so much benefit of our oil barrel, and we depend on it. But then if you start thinking about all the companies that are gonna be listed on ChatGPT, you look at the market value, right? So it's billions, trillions of dollars. You look at the employees that ultimately relied on that production of oil. And we haven't thought to any of that. What happens if we shut down the industry? What happens then? It's a pretty complex, important problem to solve, right? So, and that's their challenge, right? As we sit here and you hear, well, oil companies, are resisting the change, maybe, but because we haven't thought through all the impacts, and we're also looking for better ways to to get through, um, to get things done. So that's that's ultimately is that conversation, right? It's connecting the dots of products to input. It's then providing a solution that really what we don't want is the emissions. The oil is actually a pretty cool product that the year generates, right? And we produce it very safely. And it's better to do it locally than to bring it from overseas to the ports, right? So again, you start connecting some dots that maybe sound logical to a lot of people here. Uh, I'll, that gets missed in, in terms of policy making, in terms of the narrative and the rhetoric that happens uh, at the state level. Great. Alan? Maybe a couple of points, and I, I think the point that needs to be made is time. This change takes time. 
the energy industry we have today, and we've been part of that energy industry for the last 100 years. And what we're advocating, and I think you mentioned it, your, key, your opening point, is, is a conversation. And we need this to be a rational conversation and not a, an emotional conversation. So that's where we need to be. And time is a key component because things don't change overnight. So a couple of facts I read recently that were interesting. So if you look at in 2007, wind and solar provided about 1% of the energy needs of the world. Mm -hmm. Here we are today, it's still less than five. Yeah. So it's made great strides, but it's still less than five. Then energy has been in transition for centuries. And we need to be part of that conversation because we... We are knowledgeable, we have the expertise, we have the technology, we can help with that transition. But another bit of data is when oil was taking over from coal and biomass and things like that, it took 40 years to go from 1% of the energy supply to 10%. So time is something people forget about. And it is an evolution and it does take time, and you need that diversity of solutions. So you mentioned what are we doing from an advocate's perspective, and Francisco's right. There's a lot of discussions, a lot of uh, conversations happening. Some people are listening, some people aren't listening. So sometimes you need to give people a nudge to make sure they do listening. And ourselves and some of our industry groups are helping give people a nudge. So they do listen, so they can understand it. So many of you are familiar with a model for behavior change. It's called ABC, Antecedents, Behavior Consequences. And we spend a lot of time on the antecedents, education, making sure people really want to do that change. Sometimes you do need to go to the consequences. Mm -hmm. And those consequences aren't, we're going to shut our refineries down, we're going to stop producing. The consequences is making people aware in California the consequences of the policies that are being made by the state and how it impacts people each and every day. That's part of the consequence model. So we are seeing traction, we are seeing change when we have these open and honest conversations with people around, look, this isn't us, we're trying to be part of the solution. It's policies that are really driving up, whether it's the cost of gasoline or other sources of energy. So when we can make that, again, we, we don't want to depend on army waving. Let's look at facts, let's look at data, and let voters make a decision. And they can start speaking to their representative official and say, hey, look, why is my energy bill so high, or why is my price of gas higher here than it is when I just go over the state? So some of those consequences, you need to move into that space to get people's attention, and then just come back to the advocacy, come back to the antecedents to make sure we can educate so people understand the real value of the industry and how we can be part of the solution. But we have a great partnership with Kern County. We had a great partnership with the state for many years. Unfortunately, over the last 20 years, that's drifted, and we hope that can drift back again. That's right. That's right. And you know, I appreciate that we need time. I mean, in some of my other summit presentations, I've reminded people that it took 50 years to move from horses to cars. It did, it took 50 years. And a number one reason for the depression was the collapse of small farmers who no longer could provide horses and hay because we'd moved to cars. And that's been lost. A lot of people don't realize that. There are consequences. You know, the issue, however, is that the consequences are huge for the almost million people in Kern County, as well as your employees and others. And so we appreciate you staying in the fight, staying in the trenches, and, uh, you know, staying in Kern County. I'll just say it that way, right? <laughs> At the end of the day. So does anyone have any questions before we go to another? Oh, look, right in the back there. I'm Bernard Verrier, and I represent, oh. 
Nice, nice. Bolari. No, I'm sorry. Um, I'm Bernard Berrier. I represent HagoHydrogen.com, and we convert, we take any kind of methane and convert it to hydrogen, and we sequester the carbon in biochar, so we can take any, we can take geologic hydrogen, and we can also take uh, um, uh, bi any biomass and convert it into hydrogen and, and agricultural products. I, I agree with you that we, oil is too precious to burn. We need it. And everything we have on this table that's delivered to us is oil and gas. But we, have to, we don't have time to wait. So I ask you, Chevron, and your company, let us help you convert these hydrocarbons into hydrogen. We can do it economically and uh, suck carbon out of the atmosphere and bring it back down to Earth where it belongs. But thank you for your thoughts. Well, that is the magic of the Energy Summit Network, okay? He is networking, and uh, someone from the Chevron table, make sure you, yeah, yeah. you know, get his card Hope for Alan. Hope brought some business cards. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do that. That's right. Other questions? Someone? Okay. I'm coming. Oh, do you need another one? Yep. There you go. Uh, hi. Um, I'm going to preface this. I am young and ignorant. <laughs> so, a little embarrassing. Um, so, uh, average at the pump is about six cents less than the state average. Why can't it be a buck here? Um, could you say it again? Yeah, say your question again about uh, we'll prices at the average pump. At, average gas price at the pump here is about six cents less than the state average, which is good. But is there a reason we, I mean, if we support I think and we know who doesn't, why is it not less here? So I think, uh, if I may, I think his question is the same question I get about solar. <laughs> which is why are our electricity bills not lower when we produce all of the solar? Yeah, why is our gas prices not lower right. when we produce oil? Is that what you're asking? Pretty much. Okay, all right. Seems like a refiner question to me. I was just gonna say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am, I'm not an expert from a refinery perspective, but if you, are, we did hear this morning that we had some refining capacity yeah. in Cairn County, but a lot of the times you, we have to export that product whether to the Bay Area, whether it's in LA Basin or whether it's in San Francisco, and then that product comes back. And it's really, and if you look at the price of gas, maybe a bigger question is how much do you pay because of what the state's put on versus how much you pay from us gouging oil companies that are fleecing you each and every day. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was a joke, hopefully that's not <laughs> been recorded. But there is a lot of state tax. I don't know the number, I think $1.27 goes to the state. So a lot of it is from the state perspective. And there is a lot of work that you have to take this precious barrel that we both produce has to be delivered to a very large refinery. There's a lot of complex technology that's utilized to make that into the products we use each and every day, and then it's transported back to the consumers here. But we don't really refine a lot in Cairn County. We produce a lot. Okay. Let, me, let me maybe step in. To that. So from a producer perspective, again, it, what gets lost is we have the resources here. We should not import. Right, so if you talk to our geologists and, and, and our technical staff, they'll tell you California has massive amounts of deposits, mm -hmm. comparable to pretty much anything else in the US. So importing, right, that brings transportation costs, your, your benchmark on a Brent global crude where you should have a California specific crude, and that's forgotten in, in the whole, I mean, I think Alan explained a lot of the factors as well, but the one that gets forgotten is that local production is the solution to lower gasoline prices. It's an in, inconvenient fact, if you want to put it that way, but it's, it's, it is uh, 
one of the reasons. Um, so local energy matters in, in that we should continue to produce it. And the problem is you, you are solving the sequencing to when we talk about timing, part of the difficulty about transitioning away from oil and gas is if you don't sequence things correctly, meaning if you go in and first regulate the supply without impacting the demand, right? And then refiners shut down, capacity gets reduced, that's what creates the problem in the space. So the right sequencing should be, do what, take advantage of what you have, produce it better than anybody else can, have the same companies that want to invest in the future come in and put the infrastructure, the technology, so that we can then transition at the right time. And then you have a win-win for everybody. We, we have those out of place. First, it's about let's shut down the oil, local oil without affecting the demand, and that's what creates a dynamic that doesn't work. No, this is please. such an exciting topic. I know, right? <laughs> if you look at Nevada and Arizona, they get a lot of their gasoline from California. It's cheaper in Nevada and Arizona to buy gasoline right. than it is in California due to what the state puts on from a tax perspective. But I, I, think, I think that is spot on, Francisco. I, and maybe a good analogy is Europe. Mm -hmm. So we talk about affordable, reliable, and ever cleaner energy. And that's all of our goals, absolutely all of our goals. And if you over-index in one, like, let's imagine this is a three-legged stool. If you over-index on one, like California's doing from a lower carbon perspective, okay. your stool becomes a bit wobbly. Mm -hmm. And California's at that point where it's becoming wobbly because affordability is becoming a challenge. And if you start importing, well, I thought 75% thought okay. of your crude is importing, then you're dependent on others. And Europe was in that in 2021, 2022. They were importing a lot of their gas, i.e. not gasoline, gas, i.e. for fuel from Russia. Russia invaded Ukraine. Suddenly, they didn't get that supply anymore. They had to pull in all those expensive gas on LNG, went up to a spot price of $40, and again, so your reliability issue was there. So you have to look at affordable, reliable, and ever cleaner. And as Francisco says, California has a great potential to continue to produce the oil it has for decades to come. And if you stop that, we can't come back tomorrow. It take, it's taken a century to get to where we are today. So if everything gets shut in tomorrow because of the policies, we're not gonna, we can't come back. So take advantage of what you have today. Other questions? Uh, Mike Umbro with Californians for Energy and Science. Question for you both, thank you for being here. What role do large companies and independents need to play in educating not just our county, we know what exists here, but specifically high school students and college students which are being indoctrinated by environmental activists and fed constant misinformation from the governor, how do the industry come together to actually educate with facts and what can we do to support your companies in that effort? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in the, we have to educate and it's a job that we have to do well in every day. Um, I, I think what we've done as an industry is we, we're a little bit more fact-based, and so we always have the facts on our side, and we, we try to convince people with data, uh, which is how well we know what to do, right? We have scientists, we have great engineers uh, working for our companies. Where we lose is on the emotion, right? It's the emotional appeal um, to, uh, to the public that we lose kind of the, uh, we lost a lot of credibility and trust. Um, I think we have to change that. And so it, part of it is what we say, but part of it is how we deliver the, the talking points. Who's, who's ultimately the person that, that can connect with people? And I think we have to get creative. Um, and it does start with schools, but it also starts with opportunities to communicate and that drive that emotion, right? So uh, there's different approaches, right? You have uh, WISPA representatives here that go through very powerful advertisements 
Uh, and I have a, a great um, campaign called Levanta Tu Voz, which is kind of raise your voice that educates. And, but that's a little bit more macro, more, more for, um, for people that uh, are paying attention, uh, if you will. Um, you know, we've, we also take uh, CRC, we, we feel like we have a big role to play, and, and it's about showcasing all the, all the things that we're doing, but, but it's also bringing alliances and partnerships from people that know who we are, know how much we're needed, and so they can have a role in communicating. Um, CRC announced about two weeks ago that we have formed a, a kind of a, an innovative new partnership with the LA Rams. And part of the reason, so I, we don't have a, a consumer-facing brand. We don't sell gasoline. CRC is a producer. Um, so why would I put the effort and investment to the LA Rams? It's because of exactly your point, Mike. It's the, the Rams are believers in what we do. Everything that a football player wears, right, to go back to my example earlier, every single thing is oil made. Helmet, mouthpiece, cleats, turf. And so when you talk to the Rams about, you know, this is how, um, what oil does, and by the way, we can, we can work with you and, 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 and deliver uh, renewable natural gas, hydrogen, and all these cleaner technologies, but we need the partnership, we need the, the, the collaboration, but we need to also make sure we're educating the public. And we're gonna go to, uh, we're gonna support uh, STEAM, so schools, uh, to, to bring forward that dynamic and connect the dots for students. To, to really show the, 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 the trade-offs and to, to have a, an honest conversation. But having, bringing an NFL uh, to our community, to, uh, to, it's, it's a way for us to kind of say, well, we have the facts, but this is what, let me tell it through the eyes of an ex-player for the Rams, right? So, but there's a, there's a lot of work to do in that area. Uh, I, I do feel I have two kids, my kids, uh, obviously, they 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 brainwashed by by their dad, so but uh, they're 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 okay. <laughs> but everything around them, uh, I have my daughter standing up and and having to fight five other kids that are saying, you know, your dad and your companies are not doing something good for us. And and she stands up there and says, no, oh, lay lay out the facts. And of course, she wins the argument. So, um, <laughs> so it, it's it, it is a challenge, and we have to be be very creative and drive that emotional connection. Not just the fact, the facts will always be on our side. We're doing the right thing. It's about making sure people can appreciate how it impacts their life. Very eloquent. I, I, think, I think that is, you have to connect emotionally. And I think a look at everybody in the room has a role to play as well. We certainly are playing a role from the advocacy, from the grassroots all the way up, whether it's WISPA, whether it's ourselves, or California's for energy independence, we're working at all levels. But I think everybody in this room has a role to play, not only to advocate for industry about the great things we're doing each and every way to maintain human progress, but also how policies are impacting you personally and how they're impacting your friends and family, et cetera, et cetera. So there is an element of we have a responsibility to make sure we're advocating for industry. It's difficult, it's hard, because a lot of the populations that really don't like our industry being here are not here. They're in different places. So it's really good to hear that you're working with an NFL team just to help that education, little bits of a time, Small amounts of influence can make a big difference. I think Mayor Knorr has a question. Can you hear me now? Uh, I really enjoyed what the panel had to say, and Laura Live, I, I have enjoyed this entire thing from the very beginning. The concentration being on renewables and emerging sources of energy, and we talked about that and how important that is. The phrase, the just transition, is something I've always had a problem with because <clears throat> what we're talking about is just an integration, an introduction, a sowing of all these different new technologies into the needs for energy globally. Uh, over the past 10 years, globally, we've invested trillions, four and a half trillion dollars in renewable energies. And yet, in the same period, the percentage of direct primary energy production globally from hydrocarbons has dropped from 82% all the way down to 80%. Two percentage points, 10 years, which speaks to what you're talking about. It takes time. So 
all the new solar and all the new wind and all the new ge uh, geothermal coming online, and yet they finally did the final numbers for August, just, just last August, oil consumption globally set a brand new record of 103.78 million barrels a day. So we're not going away. The emerging sources will continue to help provide electricity. But like Francisco said, it will not replace or provide thousands of absolutely necessary everyday items critical to modern quality of life. And, and that's something that, like you said, we have got to help people understand and reach out. We cannot leave them behind. So I, I promise next year to have you on the panel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Well said. And I think we have a yeah. comment over here. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Mayor. Wow, that was loud. It's hard to go after the mayor, though. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is Carolina Wilshire with Anacapa Engineering and Design. And at Anacapa, we help uh, clients every day implement their projects. And one thing that we see as a roadblock, and that Lower Light mentioned many, many times, is water. So I was wondering how um, treatment of produced water fits in the big scheme of things. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, it, water is, is such a precious resource, right? And, and something that um, we get to actually produce a lot of water in our operations. And um, again, lo lost in, in all the noise is there's waters that we produce that has low, low total, what's called TDS, total dissolved solids, that is, it's water that's fresh and doesn't need a lot of treatment. So what both Chevron and CRC do is we work with ag and to provide that water for agriculture, such an important industry in Kern County, right? It's oil and gas and ag, that, that's the majority of the, the revenue for, for the county. So we not only coexist, we, we partner, in, but that's water that is uh, already in, in, in a place that can be used. Um, our companies also look to invest in, in the cleanup of water that's not ready uh, to, to be consumed. And we're putting different projects in place, different timelines, but a considered effort to uh, bring, as we produce more water, uh, we have the option to re-inject it, but they also have the ability to treat it and, and, and make it uh, water that can be usable for, for these community choice aggregators and, and, and different groups. So, um, so we're very focused on water. Um, I think, Lorelei, you always tell us on our projects as we, as we move forward, uh, all of our, our new projects is BYU. O W, bring your own water. Bring your own water. Uh, so right. th we bring our own water, but we're going to treat it, and uh, it's it's a critical component to the success Thank of you. our projects. Thank you. I'm going to be bold on that. As they say, we're in partnership where we are producing water, cleaning up to a very high standard, and people and agriculture are using it, and they're they're wanting it. They're yeah. actually wanting our water. We also got another field where we're putting it into wetlands, and again, that either goes into the aquifer or the river. So again, we produce lots of water. And are there more opportunities? Probably, absolutely more opportunities. However, it doesn't come without risk, and it doesn't come without people, opponents, mm -hmm. to the reuse of produced water responsibly. And again, that's some of the challenges that we have. We Logic would suggest that we clean the water up to an acceptable standard and it can be used by very respectable agricultural and other companies. But there are opponents to that as well. So it's, it, it's quite hard to navigate through this when you think logic and science will prevail, but then you get a motion from the other side that call it wastewater or use other adjectives that are very negative around a product that's near and dear to everybody living in a desert. We produce a lot of water. Are there more opportunities? Probably. Are there barriers and roadblocks? Yes. Another question? I think, okay, we have two questions. Okay, who's first? Go the other person can go first. Okay, given the, you know, the centrality of uh, CCS going forward, 
And all that's been mentioned about how important petroleum is to producing things besides gasoline. And then given the, the really the high cost of moving CO2 from, from far regions and the permitting difficulties of transporting it here, is, is it possible to increase our manufacturing sector by marrying it with CCS? Absolutely. Here in Kern County. No, no question. We can, um, because the other thing you have, um, so I completely agree uh, with, it's a natural marriage, uh, a natural opportunity, but the advantage that you also have is with our two companies, you're sitting um, with two of our li biggest landowners in, in the county. Right. So we can, we can cite projects in our fields, right? We can bring manufacturing into the county in our land, and we become a one-stop solution from energy to water. Some, I mean, we're trying to talk about data centers, an example of, of something we're focused on that need water for cooling. Um, you, you have the storage space on, that we're permitting for CCS, and it should be an enhancement to anybody else in the state, and it should be a competitive advantage to marry the two. And that's something that, that's fascinating. So one of the things that we were watching that's changing the dialogue is the view from, from tech companies. Uh, so tech companies took the view of, it's all about the environment, we can do uh, all of it with solar, wind, and battery. Uh, in fact, probably were on the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of how they felt about our industry. And then you have artificial intelligence come in and this race for world domination between all these tech companies. And all of a sudden they said, well, we're going to relax our own views on the environment. It's now about market share. And they started, they start buying power and electricity everywhere, right? So they're going to every part of the U.S., uh, buying nuclear plants, buying capacity from the grid. So the game is changing. In our view is California, we have a disadvantage because it takes a very long time to interconnect. The regulatory hurdles are unnecessarily difficult and our cost of electricity is high. So those are handicaps. But then you bring in the advantages of CCS, the advantages of making the, the data carbon free um, and having a lot of excess capacity in a natural gas combined cycle plants throughout the state. And you start developing a sense of, okay, we can keep these jobs here. I really not happy that tech companies that are born in California then leave California or invest outside of California. We should be fighting collectively to get those jobs here. And energy is a foundational aspect to tech. We can't, they, those, if people pretend like they, they didn't belong, they're one in the same. Tech companies and AI cannot happen without baseload, reliable, affordable energy. And we have an, an ability to pivot into that world. So whether it's manufacturing or data centers, absolutely agree uh, with the comment that we should uh, strive to, to make that happen. So I want to get to this question, and then I have a closing question for both of you. Thank you. Thank you both so much for doing this, well, all three of you. My question is for Mr. Pitts. I'm wondering if you can talk a little about how Chevron is handling the implementation of 1137. Remind me which one's the 1137. That's the setback law. What setbacks. Is the setback law. Oh, obviously, a couple of points. Obviously, it's disappointing that that came in. And obviously, it's disappointing that wasn't based on science, that 3200 was based on an emotion or something that numbers are pulled out the air. So as CRC and ourselves, we will be compliant with the law. And, and any regulation that comes in, we will be compliant. So we're continue, we will be looking at internally and say, yep, this is our interpretation. There's still some vagueness around how CalGen will enforce that. But whatever CalGen come up with, we'll work with them and we'll absolutely comply. We are disappointed it came in, but we will comply with that and we'll work within the regulations. So here's my question that wasn't on the sheet that I sent you. You knew it. All right. 
So I'm a pretty amazing planning director. And today, I know, right? Yeah, I, I can overrule that too. Uh, I have a magic wand and I can grant one wish for each of your companies. What is your wish, Francisco? I was at Cal Forward uh, two weeks ago and I said, I'm gonna give the same answer, certainty. We can make yeah. anything work uh, if we have certainty. We have some of the most talented people on this planet working here in Kern County. There's nothing I throw at them that they can't figure it out, but we cannot, it's all with, without the certainty, investors don't come. Right. Jobs are lost and people move into other places. So that's, that's the, we need certainty and we need to know what the rules are and then stick to those rules and we'll make it work. That's brilliant. Alan? I'm just gonna add two words to that. Okay. Reasonable and fair. <laughs> <laughs> I think certainty is great. Having regulations and policies that are reasonable and fair, uh, and we're all in. And I am proud to say that that is Kern County's motto. So thank you so much. So th let's thank everyone.